Devil Survivor is an interesting game. It's not what I'd call a masterpiece by any means, and I think you'll find there are a few Megaten games that aren't filled to the brim with huge, hard to overlook flaws. But Devil Survivor has an interesting take on the apocalyptic stories you find in the Megaten series. Unfortunately, the game ends up wasting a lot of its potential, and I don't know whether it was due to time constraints, or limitations due to the game's structures, or some other issue I haven't considered. It makes me sad because it's a good game, and with some tweaks it could have been an amazing game. Hell, I already consider it the best game in the Mega Ten series. I considered organizing this essay by the events that happen each day, but I figured it would be more effective to explain the game's strengths and weaknesses rather than summarize what happens each day. So instead of going through the events chronologically, I'll start by talking about the mysteries of the story. If you haven't played Devil Survivor yet and you're the kind of person who likes to avoid spoilers, I'd say you should stop watching and come back later as I will be spoiling Devil Survivor in its entirety. Even if you don't care for spoilers, I would recommend getting the game while you can as physical copies are expensive and hard to come by, and as a 3DS game it won't be available for digital purchase after March of 2023. So without further ado, let's talk about Shin Megami Tensei Devil Survivor. One of the strengths of this game's story can be felt heavily on your first playthrough, and that's how it makes you feel the apocalypse as it's happening. Devil Survivor follows the structure of starting out relatively peaceful, but as the game goes on, you're forced to confront the evils of humanity, and it reinforces how desperate and horrible it is to be in this situation. This may seem like a pretty standard approach for an apocalypse story, but the devil here is in the details. When it comes to Mega Ten games, most of them either have their apocalypses happen all at once, or have their stories set well into the apocalypse. Even outside of the SMT sphere of influence, Devil Survivor utilizes some aspects of the Mega Ten franchise to enhance its story. The Demon Summoning program is a staple of the Mega Ten games, but most of the time it's just used as an excuse to facilitate gameplay. This is one of the few Mega Ten games to use the Demon Summoning program as a very core aspect of its story, as the game asks the question, what would happen if anyone could use a Demon Summoning program, instead of it being limited to only important characters. This is an advantage Devil Survivor has over much of its competition, since many other games in the series have a limited amount of humans. And even the ones that have a decent human population, most of those humans either lack the demon summoning program, or are in a culture where abusing it is much less likely to occur, since those cultures are very different from our own. Devil Survivor is set in the late 2000s Japan, and as such, dropping the people of Tokyo into a lockdown surrounded by demons leads to chaotic results. This can lead to the game telling rather generic stories about the dangers of the mob mentality, but it also uses the misuse of the demon summoning program to reinforce the main themes of the game, such as the folly of humanity and what it takes to reach redemption, and what redemption really means. Aside from its atmosphere, another part of the story that was handled really well was the secrecy behind the Shomankai. At first, the Shomankai seem like a religion dedicated to the Abrahamic god that distinguishes itself from other Abrahamic religions by having an interest in humanity's ability to overcome god's ordeals. This misdirect is pretty well handled, and they put a lot of effort into convince you that they are a typical SMT-styled law faction. Some of these misdirects can be seen in how rogue Shomankai members have a might-makes-right mindset, that although they are chastised for it, you are given the option of suspecting that this is a Shomankai teaching, which can hint at their true intentions. Other examples are having one of their leaders be willingly possessed by an angel, and the nice detail that they never call God and His Majesty the same entity. This foreshadowing is handled really well, and I prefer this to how the game handles the reveal of why everyone dies in seven days. While the twist of the Shomankai worshipping a demon feels more impactful since up until that point they seem like a very sympathetic organization, learning about why and how everyone dies feels both uninteresting and handles your involvement with it poorly. My biggest issue is that they try to get you engaged by learning about how everyone dies through multiple chains of events in the game that ultimately serve no purpose, as whether or not you learn it through 10 bits comp, you still end up hearing the same information through Azuna, so the only benefit of doing the 10 bit events is to give closure to Atsuro and Shoji. Admittedly, on a first playthrough, this isn't an issue, as you can't know you'd learn this information anyway, as well as giving your characters a reason to believe the explanation once they hear it. Doing the 10-bit events makes the pacing better, but once you know that you can learn this information through Azuna, it makes it feel like, since those events are optional, you could and maybe should have done other optional or missable events instead. This problem of something working on a first playthrough but feeling pointless on a second isn't just something that's a problem with this plot point. One of the game's biggest flaws can be felt upon additional playthroughs, and that's how it has a ridiculous amount of filler. 
The most egregious example of this being on the second day, where you can spend several events checking the Yamanote line and accomplishing nothing else. Granted, I'd be more annoyed if you never looked for a way to escape, but the game runs on a time management system where every event takes up 30 minutes, and there's not enough time to do every event, so they really should have made every event meaningful. There are several events, such as the introductions of Kaido, Honda, Keisuke, and Midori, and many more who you could have simply run into while you checked the Yamanote line. In fact, you do meet some of those characters at the barricade. This may not seem like a big deal, but it can feel like next to nothing was accomplished on certain days. Even though a lot can happen, several events that happen throughout Devil Survivor either have no reason to occur, or could have been set up in previous days. While playing through the game for footage, I decided to keep track of what I consider to be pointless events, with the criteria being any event that either accomplished nothing, or what did occur could have been added on to another event. And with that highly subjective standard, I found that there were 36 events that could have been removed or tacked on to another event with nothing significant being lost. Not all of these events are like the event where you look for a way out, where the best thing to do with that time would be to introduce new characters or ideas instead of, well, get, can't get out of here, guess let's try somewhere else. Some of these events are mandatory and are entirely pointless, and doing them does nothing but take away the opportunity to do or accomplish something else. The ones that aren't mandatory, such as the Belial follower stalking Haru, are even more annoying because they don't add anything to the story, which you can't know until you do them. When I did the Belial Stalker questline in my playthrough where I intended to do Gin's route, I followed this quest to its end, and since I knew Belial was going to kidnap Haru, I thought this heads up would at least give her a chance to escape instead of being trapped in the fire during battle, or, even better, if it made her an NPC who could fight at my side. If you've played this, then you know that's not what happened. It's just a very crude attempt at foreshadowing that happens way too early on to be relevant. It's a little unreasonable to expect players to remember this, and it adds nothing other than telling you that something will happen without offering a way to alter or circumvent invent the events in said future. I know this seems like a nitpick since it's optional, but the optional events should have been doing something meaningful, because the time that was used to make it could have gone to doing literally anything else. They, maybe they could have introduced some wacky one-off demon you talk to, or foreshadowing events in a way that'll have a payoff. If doing this event chain affected the battle with Belial, I would have really liked it, but as it stands, it's just a waste of time. All of that being said, the game is engaging on a first playthrough at the very least, which is the most important thing. Most people aren't going to play the game more than once, so as long as the characters and plot are fine, then it'll be smooth sailing. Unfortunately, while there are quite a few good characters in this game, not everyone is a winner, and we're going to need to talk about at least two of them first. Gin is a charismatic bartender who looks out for various characters and can come across as a caring older brother figure, so it's not very surprising that he's one of the most popular characters in the game, and I get it. When I first played the game, he was my favorite character too, but upon playing the game multiple times, I realized there's not much to him. The reason he's popular is because he's one of the only consistently charming people in the game, but aside from his surface level charm, he has nothing going for him. As a controllable character, his stats are completely average, which is lame, but considering he's only available in his own route, which is also the route with the least amount of battles, I guess it's not that big of a deal. Despite his charm, he has little to no depth, and doesn't even fit that well in the story thematically. The characters describe him as a older and more mature version of Kaido, when what I think they meant was a version of Kaido who doesn't do anything. It implies any character development he had happened in his past when he was younger and more impulsive until he met his girlfriend Aya. They decided to break the golden rule of show don't tell, where instead of watching him grow as a character, he flatly tells us what he was like and how he changed. The most we as players can get out of this is learning how deeply he cared for Aya, which is arguably important for his character, if Aya actually mattered or did anything. Now, to be fair, not every character needs to go through an arc where they learn to change as a person, especially if they're promoting a theme or helping another character's development. But neither Gin nor Aya really does this, so Gin kind of feels underutilized. There are other characters who don't contribute much to the plot, but if nothing else, they usually have good chemistry with other members of the cast. What I mean by chemistry is the interactions and conversations between characters where they show a dynamic, and have conversations that can show us something, be it the strength of their friendship or the intensity of their rivalry. 
The reason characters like Kaido, Yuzu, and Atsuro are so likable and interesting is because they have some sort of chemistry with most of the cast. I bring this up because the cast of Devil Survivor is criminally underutilized, with many characters having little to no chemistry with others. Gin and Haru aren't necessarily the worst about this, but they feel worse because they're presented as some of the most important characters and have their own ending. The only chemistry they have with any other member of the cast is Yuzu, and while I think their mutual relationship is believable, that's all it has going for it. You'd think since they say Kaido sees Gin as an older brother figure, they'd show that, or maybe have someone say something about how Gin compares to Kaido's dead brother, but no. After Kaido tells him about the comps, they almost never speak again. Gin seems to have a deep hatred of Naoya, but this only comes through with Gin calling him a rat bastard. And even at the one point in the game where we see them in the same place, they don't really acknowledge each other. This is all without even mentioning Haru. After all, I did say being bland could be okay if you were instrumental in another character's story, so is she? Well, the short answer is no. Despite her supposed bond with Gin, they spend very little time on screen together, and they only really talk about each other in relation to Aya. While I get they're trying to reinforce that Aya is what binds them together, it's hard to give a shit when we never meet Aya and how it feels like she could have been removed from the story and, with a few tweaks, we'd hardly notice a difference. Maybe Haru could have been the singer who helped create the demon summoning program, and instead of just brushing off the Shomenkai, she could have been on the run from them. That might have been kind of interesting. Honestly, Haru and Aya are so interchangeable that you could be forgiven for mixing them up if you haven't played the game for a while. Before moving on to the next character conflict, I would be remiss if I didn't point out how strange it is that Haru is the one character who must be kept alive at all costs if you want access to a decent ending. If she successfully kills herself on the fourth day, you get locked out of all endings except for Atsuro and Yuzu's, because Belial won't show up unless he can kidnap Haru. This is kind of weird, because this is the only thing that sticks out about her. For some reason, she isn't a demon tamer, even though she can summon demons, making her the only person who shows up in the save selection menu who can't join you in battle. Part of what makes her so baffling is that the game treats her like one of its most important characters, despite the fact that she has barely anything to do with Naoya, or the Shomenkai, or even the War of Bell, the conflict that comprises most of the story. While Haru does have Aya's recorder, this isn't something that's relevant to the game's theme, such as the depths humanity can sink to. It's only relevant in Gin's route, which, not so coincidentally, ignores most of the Bell conflict. This wouldn't be so bad if she had a character arc that related to the game's themes, or had good chemistry with the other characters, but she doesn't have any of this, so her inclusion only seems to be there for Gin to have someone who can relate to his understanding for someone we never get to meet. <sighs> well, given that I've been talking about popular characters who aren't very interesting, let's shift gears and talk about a character who's interesting and not very popular. Midori is not very popular among fans of the game. The primary contributor to her unpopularity is that she's an idiot, naive to an extreme, and has a very annoying voice and personality. Wowza, Bobowza! Now, I would argue that innocent or naive characters can add a lot to a dark narrative, even if only to give other characters some hope, or de-escalate a situation. I get that she can be kind of an idiot, but I don't mind it so much because most of her idiotic moments come from core aspects of her character, which I will get into shortly. And yes, she does have a very annoying voice. But not only is that not entirely the fault of the character, it has nothing to do with the quality of the writing, and honestly, I don't really have a problem with her personality. But that's enough about the divisiveness. Let's get to what's really important about Midori, and that's how she's used in relation to the public. Midori's primary role in the story is to show how the public can misunderstand the good deeds of others and turn on people when in a situation that generates a lot of fear and paranoia. A lot of stories set in a tense and dangerous world will often have bands of people sticking together and sometimes falling to the mob mentality. And Midori's role in the story is to show how desperate and evil humanity can be in those situations. But there's a multitude of problems with how this idea was executed. 
You spend a sizable portion of the first few days trying to convince her to stop showing off, and she interprets this as you telling her to stop helping people, so she carries on and gets targeted by people hunting the demon tamers. The problem I have with this is the logic behind it. First of all, the game wants me to believe that the public wouldn't be afraid of quiet teenagers like you who summon demons and run away, but would fear a single girl who's in-universe dressed like an anime character, and yells about how she's there to save them and tells them to run while she fights them off. To the writer's credit, there are people outside the main cast who genuinely appreciate her efforts, but this is only thrown in after she decides to stop showing off. It feels like the writers didn't want to validate Midori's actions as her naivete was supposed to be a big driving force in the mid-game, so they decided to wait until after her arc was resolved before people would be reasonable. Even after you convince her to stop showing off and be more subtle in helping people to not create paranoia, she joins your party and proceeds to act exactly as she did, but now all of a sudden people are just cool with it. I don't dislike the idea of a character who wants to be a hero and ends up in danger from other humans because of it, but instead of having the public act like they have no functioning brain cells, it could have been the army or special agents hunting her down. They could have suspected her of causing the demonic problem and solving it to get more fame and recognition. This could have had some nice irony if the Shomenkai helped this group because that's literally what they're doing. They created the problem of the demon outbreak and have gone around killing demons which has gotten them more popular. The game already has lines of dialogue implying that, outside of the leadership, the Shomunkai don't want other people using comps, so this would have worked really well in the narrative. One thing I'd like to note that intrigued me was how the manga handled her far better than the games did. Something that really hurt my suspension of disbelief, and that I think contributed to a lot of players finding her to be a useless moron, is how she handles being confronted by civilians who want to kill her. In the games, she just stands still and lets them attack her without doing anything. I'm perfectly okay with her not fighting back as that's completely in character, but why wouldn't she run away? In the manga, there's a scene where her assailants need to lure her into an alleyway by telling her someone needs help and leaving no means of escape aside from attacking them, which she wasn't willing to do. Part of the problem might be how the game renders the map or how the AI was programmed or something, which is why I'm not that bad at this, especially since the writers of the manga actually decided to portray this in a way that makes sense. But then again, the manga is kind of garbage and this is one of the only things it does well. Well, that's enough about Midori for now, so let's move on to some fan favorites. Mari is one of those characters whose most significant contributions to the story is being a catalyst for another character's growth. Despite being one of the characters that has an arc that encompasses the mid-game, she doesn't do or say anything outside of her arc, which is kind of important for these types of characters. Keisuke and Kaido's conflict is an example of one of the better ones in the game because no matter how you resolve it, a change has occurred in the world, be it with a character's removal or both parties having a change of perspective that will influence their later decisions. When you contrast that with Mari, there aren't really any decisions to be made. She's the exact same character no matter what you do, she never learns anything, and the arc doesn't really influence her opinion on anything that happens later. She's one of the few characters who will join you in every route with the exception of Yuzu's, but she doesn't have any strong opinions that happen in any of them. Hell, the arc itself, despite revolving around her desire to avenge her dead boyfriend, feels more important for Kaido's growth if you involve him. Really, that's the best way to sum up Mari's character. Even though she's technically her own person, she feels more important as a catalyst for Kaido's growth. If you don't involve Kaido in her arc, then you've guaranteed Keisuke's death as you need to distract Kaido long enough to stop or join Keisuke, but I have more to say about that when talking about their conflict in the next section. When Kaido joins in, we get to see his and Mari's bonds grow, which comes through when he reminds him that Mari is more important than any petty revenge for his gang, and helping Mari also gives him closure on his brother's death. Aside from giving Kaido a distraction, helping Mari served another valuable purpose, and that was getting Kaido to think about his relationship with his gang. Kaido supposedly doesn't like the demons. He often remarks about how they're useless idiots, or how he doesn't trust any of them, or how having to track down the guy who killed some of them is a pain in the ass, and more importantly, he says, Well, I'm not surprised if somebody's out to get us. We are a bunch of scum. Now, this is all more than likely Kaido being reserved with his feelings because I don't think he dislikes his gang. He does far too much for them for that to be the case. I think it's the obligation that he feels as their leader that makes him so angry because Kaido isn't a natural leader. 
Despite his constant desire for power, he never tries to challenge you for the title of King of Bell and the King of Demons route, although I don't think he really understands the nature of the Bell conflict anyway. So while part of it is probably him seeing you as a friend, I also think he'd rather not have to deal with the stressful job of being a leader and would rather be close to someone in power. None of that has anything to do with Mari's arc and has more to do with who Kaido is as a person, but what's most important here is that when Kaido helps Mari kill Kudlok, he feels less inclined to fulfill his responsibilities as leader of the demons because, since his brother has been avenged, he feels the weight of responsibility is no longer upon him to honor his brother's legacy. It's one of the resolutions to Kaido's deepest conflicts and helps him become a better person. One of the ways we can see this is what happens in his conflict with Keisuke. When I said this game had a lot of wasted potential, I had this section of the game in mind. Sure, there are a lot of parts that have unrealized potential, but this is a part of the game that came so close to being great, but falls short. Before we get into the problems, let's talk about what the conflict actually is. This conflict is about the rivalry between Kaido, a punk leader of a gang whose personality works pretty well in this sort of situation, as characters like Honda point out, and Keisuke, a boy who wants to bring the hammer of justice down upon the sinners in the lockdown. As far as Kaido's place in the arc is concerned, despite making up half of the conflict, he has barely any stakes in its outcome. As I said earlier, he doesn't really like being a gang leader and only acts as a leader out of obligation, and remarks about how a comp is so much better because he doesn't have to constantly ensure the loyalty of his men, and, you know, doesn't have to worry about them dying. Let's contrast that with Keisuke, a boy not much younger than Kaido who was bullied in school and when he sees a lynch mob trying to murder an innocent girl, he does something completely irrational, like try to save her life. Wait a minute. Now, this might be a bit of a hot take, but Keisuke did nothing wrong. The worst I could say about him is that he's misguided and his ideology could grow into something bad, but outside of those criticisms, he doesn't do anything that's unreasonable after he gets Yama. I like Kaido a lot more because he's way more charismatic, but Keisuke is doing a lot more good for the world. Almost no one takes his side in this matter, and I kinda get why because the game has a kind of black and white view of morality where murder is always bad no matter the context, and most players are gonna be natural inclined to agree with the game's message. Now, I'm not going to defend him too much because he does have a few flaws. I don't really like how he thinks one being should be the arbiter of whether a person should live or die, especially when said judge says standing in his way is punishable by death, but people tend to give him way too much shit. Hear me out on this one. What did Keisuke do wrong? Not ideologically or philosophically, but what did he do that was wrong before your intervention? I'll admit wanting to kill the civilian lynch mob is a bit extreme considering it's doubtful they could even hurt Midori, but that kind of gets into what I talked about earlier in Midori's conflict and how that was mishandled. That aside, let's consider who we know he kills and more importantly, who he's after. He can come across as a bit of a zealot, but the people we see him or hear him kill are people who want to murder a teenager for saving lives, people who beat an old lady to death who took her food when she tried to share, and cops that previously abused their power and who your characters gave a second chance that they used to hurt more people. Maybe I overlooked something, but I don't recall anything in the game implying he killed people who were only guilty of petty crimes. If anything, he implies the opposite when he says that Yama is the one dispensing justice, not his personal prejudice, implying that not every crime merits the death penalty. Now, I don't think it's really ideal to let one being be the sole judge of who lives and dies, and I think Keisuke shouldn't try to avoid responsibility by saying Yama did it, as that's not really any different from saying I didn't kill people, the gun did. But it seems like a missed opportunity to handle Keisuke's arc the way they did. Honestly, a lot of the game has missed opportunities, but I have spent the majority of this retrospective talking about what went wrong and haven't spent much time going over what could be improved. But now that I've gone over the major arcs of the mid-game, I think it's time I propose some solutions to the issues I've brought up. So far, the changes I've proposed to make Devil Survivor more interesting have been isolated to individual character arcs, but here I want to try to do something different. I want to fold the character arcs of Midori, Keisuke, Kaido, and Mari into a singular narrative that brings some of the themes together. To start, I need to talk about how not a lot happens on days 4 through 6. The main things that happen are learning about the government plot to kill everyone, which has very little replay value, Dealing with the Kaido vs. Keisuke conflict, which didn't come anywhere near its potential and ultimately says very little. And helping Mari kill Kudlok, which is more important for Kaido's development than her own, despite Kaido's inclusion being optional. 
So how would I go about fixing this? Well, for the first point, you can keep the part of the game where you learn about the government plot to kill everyone in the lockdown, but add more alternative events. As I said in the plot twist section, it wastes too much time and really the only way to rectify this is with more content. This may seem a little off track, but hear me out. Black Frost is a character I don't like, for a lot of reasons. In fact, it should have just been Midori's special demon, like Yama or Pazuzu, instead of a bad comedic relief character. This isn't to say I dislike the idea of a demon being their own character. In fact, I think it'd be cool to fill a lot of this wasted time with mini stories about demons who do their own thing, and you can help them out in order to unlock the ability to fuse them. Devil Survivor 2 does a little bit of this, but even that game doesn't utilize this as well as it could. Even if they didn't want to create demon side quests, the game would have really benefited from more demon bosses that are harder to take out. I get that the game was on a tight schedule, and in Devil Survivor 2 there are more bosses like this, which is why, although I think the lack of these kinds of demons is a missed opportunity, it's not a huge deal because it's something the devs seem to understand was a missed opportunity. As for the other events, something that could have made this act the most enjoyable part of the game is if they took the themes of Keisuke's dedication to order versus Kaido's chaotic nature leading him to do as he pleases and allowed the player to be a part of it. In most Megaten games, your choices aren't really relevant until the very end of the game where all the routes usually have the same amount and type of content, just with different characters and cutscenes. Devil Survivor also fell into this until the 8th days came out in the overclocked re-release, but I'll talk about those 8th days when I get to the endings. Here's my proposal. Your party should have been forced to make a decision when it comes to the conflict between Keisuke and Kaido that doesn't just boil down to are you gonna let Keisuke die, with Mari and Midori playing bigger parts. Here's how I think it would work. First, Midori doesn't join your party for a while and will only join you under certain conditions. Then, when Keisuke goes off to do his own thing, Honda joins your party temporarily so that you can have a full team. What I have in mind is that Atsuro already knows about Keisuke's past with bullying and explains it to the group so they understand why he does what he does. And Honda could talk about Kaido's past, or your group could ask Mari about it. We never actually learn about Kaido's past directly, but I think there's a lot of subtext to support my interpretation of Kaido. Seeing how he's a part of a gang and doesn't eat much when you have a meal with him in the King of Demons route, it's not a stretch to believe he's poor, and given his tough guy attitude and affiliation with gangs and violence, he may have had a rough relationship with his parents. They don't need to state this information outright, but this is important because it would strike a chord with Yuzu, who also has a rough relationship with her parents and, despite her constant fighting with Kaido, she could feel some sympathy for him. After learning more about Keisuke and Kaido, you would have to make a choice. Join one and oppose the other. Atsuro, wanting to help out his old friend in spite of his qualms, would encourage you to join Keisuke, and either Yuzu or Honda would encourage you to help Kaido, with Yuzu sympathizing with his desire to protect and avenge his friends, or Honda wanting to help out the guy who watched his back, and having either Honda or Yuzu be neutral on the subject based on who sympathized with Kaido. No matter what side you pick, everyone in your party would follow what you say, and you would either go to meet with Mari or Keisuke to help out with their respective arcs. If you side with Kaido, you send Honda to tell Kaido that Mari is in danger while Mari joins your team while you fight Kudlock. Also, Kresnik, no longer half-possessing Mari because that's stupid. Instead, he is also just her special demon like Kaido's Pazuzu. When you fight Kudlock, Honda and Kaido would join halfway through and together you kill Kudlock. Hooray! This would be a good opportunity for Mari to help Kaido reconcile with his feelings about leading the demons, as she kinda already does in the game to a degree, and he would come out a better person because of it, resulting in him joining your party. After sorting that out, you decide that Keisuke needs to be stopped but not killed. This could culminate in a battle where you fight Keisuke and Midori, who would be helping out the guy who saved her and, despite her hesitations, agrees that Keisuke is fighting for justice. After winning the battle, you smash their comps. The importance here being that your actions need to have consequences. If you side with Kaido, you will give up the ability to recruit Keisuke and Midori as they will no longer have comps. They could theoretically get new ones, but it'd work better thematically and mechanically to give weight to your decision since they were defeated because you opposed them. This also works better since there's a lot of evidence that the comps your party uses are special since most of the main characters get them from Naoya. Something pretty similar would happen if you choose to side with Keisuke. 
You'd meet up with him and decide to help him save Midori, who's still being targeted by a mob, and maybe convince him to turn down the murder angle just a bit. Instead of finding Midori in either of the situations present in the game or manga, she's instead fighting off demon tamers who are out to get revenge on the anti-tamer mob. This could be a great way to make the opponents you're fighting sympathetic as they're trying to kill people who want you dead, and it'd be a good way to show the mob that Midori is sincere in her desire to help people, thus breaking up the mob. It would also be a great way to show Keisuke that people can change for the better and that the world isn't so black and white. This would also reinforce how he acts on the 8th day of the Kingdom of Saints route. After all this is said and done, you'd end up fighting Kaido and Mari, who would join the fight to repay her debt to Kaido for helping her and because she cares about him, and fighting them would lead to Kaido and Mari's comps being smashed. To tie the arcs nicely together into the main plot, after this conflict when you run into Naoya, Kaido or Keisuke can say that he was the one who gave them their comps, which already happens in the game if you keep Keisuke alive. This could imply that Naoya had a hand at manipulating the events, in order to gauge what kind of person you'll become so he can convince you to join him by the end. A good way of doing this could be showing his approval for siding with Kaido in his more chaotic beliefs, or disappointment if you side with Keisuke and his more lawful beliefs. These changes wouldn't make the mid-game a masterpiece, but it would significantly improve it in my opinion, and it would make repeat playthroughs more worthwhile. Now, before I get on to the endings, I feel it's important to talk about something that I've largely ignored so far. The Demons of Bell are the primary bosses and are the contenders for the main conflict of the game, the War of Bell. In Devil Survivor, the Tower of Babel was once a demonic being that held great power and knowledge, and ruled the world with an iron fist. This rule lasted until God decided that he wasn't cool with it, so he kicked its ass. The five demons that you fight throughout the game are those who are crowned with the name of Bel, Belder, Belial, Jezebel, Beelzebaul, and Belbereth. Belder, or rather Balder, is a god from Norse mythology who was loved by all until Loki got him killed and now he's an angry vampire who wants to kill everyone? Belder is by far the strangest boss in Devil Survivor. He has the most annoying gimmick where he's immune to all damage except for the Devil's Fuge, which replaces your melee attacks, which can make the fight feel very prolonged and annoying. He's so far removed from his mythology that it kind of makes me wonder why they even bothered using him considering there are other demons with Bell in their name they could have used. Especially considering that, again, Belder's name is Balder. I can think of one use for him that would make his inclusion infinitely better, and that would be to make Belder a law-aligned Bell. If they really wanted to insist on changing Baldur's name to Belder so that he would be a demon crowned with the name Bell, make him act more like he is in mythology, where he's a cool dude who people like. They could have done literally any other demon with Bell in their name as the first boss. Hell, it could have even been Belphegor. I think a better use for Belder would be a demon who, like Loki, can disguise himself as a human and is fighting to make the world a better place. This would also work well with the unused foreshadowing the game already has. The way you end up getting the Devil's Fuge is being told about it by Loki and then taking it from the Servants of Belial. If they made the Servants of Belial a more frequent opponent, which would have been welcome considering the game already wastes a lot of time with the Belial follower stalking Haru, which could have instead been used on the Belial followers getting the Devil's Fuge and sneaking it to their leader. This way, instead of having Haru in the fire pit because of Musingan magic, it's Belial burning Belder to death with the power of the Devil's Fuge. It could even give the fight a tragic note where he passes his powers onto you once he realizes that you are able, and therefore have the ability to make the world a better place. All of this being said, I don't think demons need to always fully live up to their mythology, but when you make a guy like Belder into a weird homicidal vampire, I have to raise an eyebrow. Especially because it seems like an unintentional misdirect for Mari's subplot, both of which revolving around a homicidal vampire. I'm not going to talk too much about the specifics of the other Bells, as Belder was an exceptionally odd case, but I do want to talk about the poor pacing of the Bells. There is a sizable chunk of time between when you fight Belder and when you fight Belial, and in that time you mostly focus on the side plots of the game that reinforce its themes, but you occasionally learn bits and pieces of information about the true nature of this conflict, as told by the likes of Loki, the Shomenkai founder, and Naoya. This is a pretty good way of building up the bosses you'll fight on day 6 onwards, but there's a slight issue that has to do with the game's pacing. 
Unfortunately, the game shoves the majority of its important bosses on day 7, which was the last day of the game in the DS release of Devil Survivor. While they did an admirable job building up Jezebel by having it foreshadowed that it's living inside of Amane, and Belbereth as the god of the Shomenkai during the setup on days 4 through 6, Beelzebow kinda just comes out of nowhere. He's stated to be just as strong as Belbereth until he tells you that he's actually weaker but is doing this because Lucifer told him to. While I find the idea of any Bell willingly working for another to be awkward as why would any Bell want to be submissive to another and why wouldn't a stronger one want to kill a weaker one? It makes a bit more sense for Belbreth to want Jezebel as his agent in the human world, even though any strong demon could probably fill that role. I don't get why Jezebel or Beelzebel work for him. The closest we get to an explanation is that they all want to kill God and they don't really care who ends up doing it, so at least in the case of Jezebel, she doesn't care if it's her. As far as Beelzebel is concerned, we never learn why Lucifer wanted to assist Belbreth, especially because Belbreth said he wanted to kill Lucifer. The most I can deduce is that Lucifer just wants to challenge the player, and that's the real reason why Jezebel and Beelzebel are here in the first place. They just exist to challenge the player and make it seem like they have a reasonable chance at beating Belbereth. I find this to be unfortunate because I like the idea of this conflict, but since there are only really three contenders aside from yourself, those being Belder, Belial, and Belbereth, trying to win and those first two are presented as completely outclassed by the third, it can diminish the stakes. It may have been cool to at least hear about other bells making attempts at fighting the others and getting crushed to make the war feel like it's an actual war rather than basically everyone wants to kill you. I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention Babel, the final boss of the game. It's a fine fight and makes for a climactic final battle, but it's a bit uninteresting. In the King of Demons and Kingdom of Saints route, you end up refighting all the bells, and while I appreciate a good endurance battle, recycling the bosses feels kinda uninspired. While I understand that this is mostly a test to see if you've earned the power of Bell, this whole fight in all routes really would have been more interesting if you fought an enemy with some agency. Now, that's really all my thoughts on the demons of Bell, so it's time to talk about what you've been fighting for throughout the game, or rather, what path you wish to follow, the various endings and the eighth days when they're applicable. <laughs> Now, before I get into the good endings in 8th Day expansions, I'm going to need to get to the bad and short endings first, starting with the Silent Revolution. Atsuro's ending might just be the worst ending in the game, excluding the early Day 6 ending, but including the 8th Days. This may come across as a rather bold claim, especially considering the game wants to present this as one of the good endings, but like a lot of things in Mega Ten, even though the language they use and the music that's played sounds triumphant, thinking about it for more than 5 seconds will probably lead you to realize that this ending is terrible. Instead of boring you with the details of how you came to get this ending, I'm going to focus on why it's boring writing and why it's terrible for the world. First of all, this route leaves all the writing about Naoya, Abel, and God on the table while focusing on giving Japan's military a monopoly on demons that conventional weapons cannot harm. When I phrase it like that, it doesn't sound great, does it? Now, to give it the faintest bit of credit, on paper, Atsuro's initial idea doesn't sound that bad. Using demons to help humanity grow technologically isn't the worst idea ever conceived. The biggest problem I have is the logic of giving the government control of the demons to help humans progress, you know, aside from the potential enslavement of demons who aren't all evil, is that you can just do all of that as the King of Bell anyway. To the game's credit, they do acknowledge this, and Atsuro doesn't want you to be a King of Bell because he thinks that would make you a tyrant and he wants to believe in humanity. The response Naya gives is, instead of saying something like giving one government a monopoly on demons is really dumb and unlikely to be democratic, could turn Japan into a military-industrial complex and drastically change the power dynamics in global politics, making everyone afraid of Japan, which could lead to very negative consequences. He says that believing in humanity is dumb, and therefore making the ideological opposition to the silent revolution pessimism. This is something that a lot of people will try to do if they want to persuade you on something. They'll use language that sounds favorable and evokes positive feelings so that you associate what's being proposed as positive. In the case of Atsuro's ending, the writers want you to feel that Atsuro is being an optimist, and that if you tried really hard, his vision could be fulfilled. And as someone whose online handle is The Hobbit Optimist, I can appreciate optimism. However, optimism isn't really relevant here. 
The issue is that optimism is being used as a shield against criticism because it doesn't explain why one government should have a monopoly on demons, or why a king of bell couldn't help humanity and more. I will acknowledge that Otsuro's criticism that being a king of bell would make you a tyrant is valid on some level. After all, earlier, I did state that one being being the arbiter of who lives and dies is pretty messed up. However, I'll take one guy with all that power, especially if that one guy has been consistently fighting to save lives, instead of a government that had a very ineffective response to the demons appearing in Tokyo and didn't take proper measures to save as many lives as possible. Although, to be fair, you could levy some of those issues against the angels, but I digress. The fact of the matter is, this isn't about optimism or the morality of the King of Bell. What's really going on is that Atsuro wants to have someone else do the thinking for him. The political situation of the demon apocalypse is complicated, and letting the official government handle it means you don't have to think about it too much and don't have to take responsibility if shit hits the fan. Admittedly, that's a very uncharitable interpretation of Otsuro's stance, and you can call me a pessimist if you want, but the reality of the matter is that I don't think we should trust any single government with all that power. Hell, even if Japan didn't have a monopoly on it, I still wouldn't be in favor of giving any military even more power. Although I'm sure Otsuro doesn't intend for the demons to be weaponized, it's more than likely going to happen eventually, and the fact that he doesn't acknowledge this makes me question both his intelligence and what the writers were thinking. This could have been a halfway decent ending if Otsuro wanted the whole of humanity to have democratic access to the demons, which on paper sounds okay. But aside from just giving the demons to Japan, many characters point out that trapping many innocent people in the lockdown the way the government did was not the most democratic solution, and giving demons to the government that wanted to gaslight the situation is more than a little questionable. <sighs> well, now that I'm done talking about the worst ending, I may as well move on to the other ending that's bad and has no eighth day. <laughs> So, I went over a lot of my issues with Gin when talking about him, but I think his ending is emblematic of my problems. After you learn that Aya disappeared without a trace, Gin doesn't even think to ask Amane or even Naoya if there's a way to save her, and immediately goes to wanting to return Tokyo to its original state. Now, I might understand why Gin wouldn't want to talk to Naoya, especially considering Naoya is notoriously hard to find, and I'd even get not wanting to talk to a member of the Shomankai if Gin didn't already swallow whatever hesitations he may have had and confront Amane on how to get rid of the demons. Honestly, him not even asking her isn't a big deal because it could just turn out she's gone and that's the end of it. My problem isn't really with Gin, but how the game focuses on the nobility of his desires rather than the ramifications of his goals. For all intents and purposes, Gin wants to return the world to the status quo. Rather than try and change the world for the better like Atsuro even though the execution of his ending was flawed, Gin would rather see the world back the way it was. Like I said with Atsuro's ending, the game is trying to present not thinking about how to change the world for the better and instead ignoring the world's faults or hoping someone else will solve the problem for you, and this is presented as the best course of action. It's a lazy mindset and one that I have a lot of issues with because if you have the power to improve things but don't, that makes you complicit in the world's issues. That really is all I have to say about Gin's ending because like the Silent Revolution, it drops all the Abel, God, and Cain conflict and has the least amount of interesting dialogue. A version of this ending I have a little bit more respect for is the last neutral ending. <laughs> Finally, almost done talking about the neutral endings, and an ending with an eighth today? What fun! So, what's this ending about? Oh, you know, shitting on Yuzu's character development and leaving people to die! Okay, now that we're off to a great start, I suppose I should talk about Yuzu, who I've really neglected for the majority of this essay, but that's not a result of me disliking her. Similarly to Keisuke and Midori, she's kind of an unpopular character, and I think that has a lot to do with how she acts in this and the King of Demons endings. First off, she's one of the characters who's wanted to escape the lockdown the most and has found this situation terrifying, which I like. I really hate it when characters we're supposed to relate to act like these apocalyptic situations are just minor inconveniences. Realistically, most people in this sort of situation would freak the fuck out and do nothing. Hell, your party ends up looking at people who spend their time in the lockdown doing nothing and resenting them, only to realize they'd probably be doing the same thing if they didn't have comps. This is what makes Yuzu such a good character. It's how human she is. That being said, if that's all there was to her, I'd probably feel as neutrally about her as I do Mari. 
What sets her apart is how, like Kaido and Atsuro, she has chemistry with a large portion of the cast and develops as a person throughout the game in a meaningful way in pretty much every route, even the ones where it can feel stupid like hers and Naoya's. The reason I say this route can ruin Yuzu is because it frames her as a coward who's taking the easy way out. Hers is the only route that you're guaranteed to have access to and most people are going to hear out all of their options. So when she says she still wants to run away even though she should know by now that you're the only one who can save the people by ending the War of Bell, it can make her seem horribly selfish. This kills how they set up her character because even if you fail to have access to other routes, you still know that leaving would cause everyone inside the lockdown to die, or worse, leak the demons into the world. This is a problem because as early as day two, she tries to swallow her fear and fight to save people even when she could just run away. The reason this ending even exists is for people who fuck up and can't do any other ending. In that case, her saying you should run away makes sense, but I think they should have just made it so that there's always a better ending available or removing her ending as an option if you have access to another. Now I get that they were kinda stuck between a rock and a hard place here because they may have wanted to punish players who stupidly push away all their options and don't want to remove the option to do certain endings. And given she has an 8th day, this makes sense as some people are going to save before the ending lock so that they can play every route. Speaking of 8th days, this seems like a good chance to talk about it. I don't have much to say about this one compared to the others as it's a pretty simple story. You learn that you're wanted criminals and decide to go back and fix the issue. I think it may have been rushed seeing as the battles where you save Midori and Kaido have defeat and battle conditions that aren't actually implemented, and this rushing kinda leaks into the story as well. If you're going to go back and solve the problem that you ran away from anyway, it makes it seem like you ran away for nothing. But if you didn't have access to any other endings, then this ending is a lot better. I'll give them credit for trying to give players who side with her a happy ending, even if that does kind of defeat the point of the original, and actually working in a theme, either of taking responsibility for your actions and redeeming yourself if you had access to other endings, or about how even if you feel trapped and without options, you can still make the best with the bad situation. The cynic in me says that that second interpretation was unintended, as they really hammer home how we need to take responsibility for what we do, but hey, I like giving them the benefit of the doubt. Even if this is unintentional, it works as a message. Now that we're finished talking about the neutral endings, it's time to talk about one of the more interesting endings. Kane, the first murderer otherwise known as Naoya, is probably the most interesting and important character in Devil Survivor. It doesn't take a biblical scholar to know the story of Cain and Abel, and upon hearing the angel Remiel call you Abel and now you Cain, can lead to a player growing most suspicious of their character's cousin. He's responsible for everything you go through in the game. If he hadn't developed the comps, the Shomunkai couldn't have enacted their plan which resulted in the lockdown. If he hadn't given you comps, you wouldn't have had to carry the burden of being the protagonist, and if we go further back in time, if he hadn't killed you a millennia or so ago, none of this would have happened. That being said, now he is not some one-dimensional villain, and his enemy, God, isn't fully innocent in the matter of Naoya's sins. But since Naoya doesn't give you all the details in his route, I'm not going to give you them either. I'll get into it later. Instead, I want to focus on what you're told by Naoya and what context clues the game gives you as to the nature of the conflict, because piecing together what's going on through his side is an interesting way of analyzing him. The first thing worth noting is how he's been trying to coax you to be on his side from the start. He's the one who gave you the comps that helped you survive this long and, like it or not, he's given you the opportunity to reshape the world. He's made a point in the few interactions you've had before the seventh day to get you to blame God and the angels for the conflict you're trapped in. He also tried to downplay his involvement with the lockdown to make you blame people other than him. Part of what helps his manipulation is that everything he says is partially true. Not to mention, he almost never tells you an outright lie. He certainly hides information from you and will avoid questions frequently, but he never tells you an untrue statement. Now, this aversion to lying has nothing to do with any sense of honor or virtue. He doesn't see value in those things. He only helps people who he sees as useful, like Kaido, or if he has some odd affinity for them, like Atsuro. No, I think the reason he never lies is because he's kinda bad at it. Sure, not lying makes him sound more credible, but to really seal the deal it would have been better to lie to you rather than dodge questions you and your friends ask him. 
If he wanted to control you completely, he would try to color your perception heavily enough that only his outlook would seem correct. But he isn't a good enough liar to pull this off, so he simply avoids these questions. I do admit it's more than a little annoying that you can't really look into what people mean when they call you Abel and now you Cain, but that's something the law route acknowledges, so it's not a big deal. Now, this was the first route I did when I played the game, and for context, my only other options in my first playthrough were Yuzu and Amane, and while I haven't gotten into Amane's route yet, and today I'd say it's a better route, when I first played the game I was neutral scum who didn't have access to Gin's route and didn't want to side with Law. For me, what made Naya more convincing than Remiel was that he presented his ending as having more flexibility, which, to be fair, it kinda does. You do need to murder God, but if you want to make the world a better place, you can. If you want to be a brutal dictator, you also can. All Naoya wants is revenge against God and, to a lesser extent, the survival of humanity, which he thinks is unlikely in a world under Belbareth's rule. Here's my and many others' problem with the angels in Devil Survivor. They blame all of humanity for what a small cult did. This isn't even like in Strange Journey, where humanity at large is contributing to the destruction of the Earth via global warming. Nobody wanted the Shomenkai to do what they did, and for most of their followers, they don't even understand what they've signed up for, as we can see with members who ditched the Shomenkai. Even though the actions of the Shomenkai can't really be considered emblematic of the whole of humanity, the angels, and by extension God, decide to punish everyone in the lockdown, and decide that if the people in the lockdown can't solve this problem, humanity's free will will be removed. The entire world will be punished for what a small cult did. This is one of the many reasons Naoya can seem more appealing, even though he is meant to seem very suspicious. It would have been easy to write Naoya off as a petty bastard who wanted God dead by any means necessary, who you might feel some sympathy for, but ultimately saw as a villain. Luckily, they didn't really take this route, and even though in the original game he barely had any screen time and we didn't get to see his human side that often, this is something that was rectified and overclocked. In the original, the most we got of this was him saying that even though he wanted revenge, he wouldn't want it from the likes of Belbrith because in his eyes, it'd be replacing a self-righteous tyrant with a more evil one. He knows you're a decent person who wouldn't screw humanity, which is enough for him. We get to see more of this on every eighth day where, no matter what route you go on, he helps you out because deep down he does care about you, despite his edgy demeanor. Something I think that's interesting is the idea of redeeming himself by giving you the power of Bell. In Amane's route, where he starts out as your enemy, he tells you that he wanted you to kill God because he thought it would be the most ironic way of getting revenge, as you are God's beloved child. But I think there's a little more to it than that. I think he wanted to give you the power of Bell as a roundabout way of apologizing for killing you in ancient times. Even though your character doesn't remember being able, that doesn't change the fact that you carry his soul and Naoya still treats you as his brother. There's even some great moments throughout the route, such as when he tells you he's proud of you in his route and admires your actions in Atsuro's, you know, after you beat him up. Other ways he shows his brotherly behavior is when he tries to protect you from shady people who want to manipulate you, like Loki, with an attitude of, no one is allowed to take advantage of my brother, except for me. Naya does a ton of bad things, including but not limited to murdering you in ancient times, but as many of the routes show, he does genuinely love and care about you, even if he has motives outside of that. Now, it's possible I'm giving the writers too much credit here because these games aren't exactly known for being subtle. It's entirely possible the writers didn't think this far and made Naoya act shady so you'd think he's in the wrong because, as I stated earlier, before the overclocked re-release, the game wanted to present the neutral endings, with the exception of Yuzu's, as the best endings. The easiest way to make you feel like you made the wrong choice would be to have the route representative acting shady. That being said, I do want to think the writers knew what they were doing when it came to developing Naoya because, especially in the eighth days, he's the most interesting and well-developed character. Something I've been mentioning throughout this retrospective is the improvements that came with the overclocked 3DS remake. The original game, aside from some extremely poor quality of life, didn't have the 8th days and therefore certain endings felt unfinished and certain characters underutilized. In the original, Naoya wasn't really a relevant part of the good endings, not even showing up in Gins until the epilogue. But in the context of Overclocked, he's definitely the central focus of both the Law, Chaos, and Yuzu's ending. In the original, Naya being Kane was just kind of something that was thrown in and not really developed. While Naya's own route doesn't realize its full potential, Amane's route gives him the full development he deserves, but before I can get into that, I need to talk about his 8th day. Naya's 8th day is bad. It's easily worse than the other two, and it feels like it was written by a completely different team than the other routes. 
The biggest problems are twofold. It has the moral depth of Fallout 3, and it has no theme or message that ties the ending together like the other eighth days. To get to the first point, this day is known as the King's Decision because you, the King of Bell, have to make one really stupid choice. To kill or not to kill? That is the question. To give some context, the day starts out by Naoya saying the angels are going to take advantage of your human weaknesses. When I first heard this, especially because they had just put an emphasis on Yuzu's separation from the group, I thought the angels were going to take her hostage or turn her against the player. I thought they were going to relegate her to a damsel in distress or try to turn her against you, which would have been really dumb, especially because this is a video game, and a Megaten game no less, so there would have been a way to save her and kill God at the same time. Luckily, they didn't do that. They did something arguably dumber. The big, smart, and definitely charismatic angels decide to put a bounty on your head, saying that when you die, the lockdown ends. Part of what makes this worse is that they got my hopes up when Naoya said they'd take advantage of my human weaknesses. I thought they would at least have a decent plan, like isolating me from my allies or forcing me to split up from the group or something. I'd gladly take a cliché over this level of incompetence. I get they're hoping if you kill people, humanity turns against you, and if you don't, you'll be, like, slightly inconvenienced, but it's still a shit plan because unlike Midori, my character knows how to run away. Now, on paper, this isn't necessarily the worst plan in the world. If it was a starting off point to break your will and never give you a moment to rest, maybe it could have become something, but nope. Not only does your party not have to worry that much about the mob, even if they let the mob come after them, you have all the time in the world to have silly banter with your party in broad daylight. Oh, and speaking of letting the mob come after you, the decision of killing versus not killing is an extremely out of character one. The presented benefits are that killing would get people to leave you alone, and not killing would eventually lead to the people turning on the angels. This choice will decide your ending, good or bad. You'll never guess which is which. The worst thing about this is that both choices make the game worse. If you don't kill people, you have the same goddamn conversation 18 times with dipshit civilians that go along the lines of this. They tell you to die, you explain angels bad, one guy says they should kill you anyway, another guy says you're probably right, and another guy is unsure while you all run away. This conversation never gets any better, and after having enough times Yuzu, who's kinda just been watching what's going on, has the galaxy brain realization that maybe we should get some proof so that people will leave you. And when she does, everyone rallies behind you with a power of friendship speech. Fucking gag me. If you think the killing route would be better, I hate to burst your bubble, but no, it really isn't. In this route, you're out of character and are uncharacteristically mean to people. It culminates in everyone treating you like Hitler, even though not only do you barely kill people, you only kill people in self-defense, and only threaten people who are unarmed. I honestly have no idea why they gave you this choice considering your team has been working on a compromise for the entire rest of the game. Don't kill people, but if they attack you, break their comps. It's not rocket science, and even if it was, now you should understand that being the smart guy he is. Now, I don't want to just shit on this ending, so I want to talk about the parts I enjoyed and what I think needs to be done to improve it. First of all, I actually like a lot of the conversations you have with Kaido. Honestly, Kaido is the highlight of this eighth day. He has amusing banter with everyone, and honestly, he initiates the funniest conversation in the game if Mari is alive. Everyone wants us dead and all! Huh? That's nothing new. Tadashi, most people aren't threatened with death every day. Oh. This isn't a super interesting scene or anything, it's just really humanizing and a nice change of pace from his constant bitching and moaning about not being allowed to kill people. Which I find annoying because it's really at odds with the character development he should have undergone when he helped Mari. There is one part of the don't kill route that's actually pretty good and it has to do with acknowledging the problem of Yuzu running away. Something I always found annoying about how they handled Yuzu is how she abandons you in the King of Demons route. I get that she's scared, but she doesn't even like God, and her route is all about antagonizing the angel, so why does she leave? I mean, it's probably because she's afraid that you'll become a demon and lose yourself, but having a friend who will stay by your side will probably help to prevent that from happening. I wouldn't have minded it as much if she, like, ran away at first but then returned later, maybe during the seventh day battle when the angel mini-bosses attack you, she could have appeared to give you a hand. This would have been fitting since the leader of these angels is the final boss of her seventh day. 
Something I haven't talked about with this ending is that its party has the most amount of interpersonal chemistry, to the point where every character has chemistry with at least two other characters. This party's chemistry would have only been improved by Yuzu's addition since she has a unique relationship with Atsuro, Kaido, and Naoya compared to everyone else in the party, creating more entertaining and interesting conversations. This would also fit in with the additions I described earlier, as she would have initially said she agrees with Kaido more than Keisuke, as Yuzu and Kaido have a kind of love-hate relationship. This is somewhat rectified on the eighth day when Yuzu confesses to Midori that she regrets running away and not helping you out, ending with her rejoining you and getting the people on your side. Now that I've gone over what I think it did well, I'll go over what I think should have been changed to make this day not just the plot of SMT4 Apocalypse. I think the choice to focus on shouldn't have been becoming a different person or arbitrarily banning your ability to fight humans. Instead, it should have focused on secrecy versus popularity. This doesn't have much to do with the themes, but rather the events. As I said before, you have the exact same conversation about angels being bad and it's boring as shit. What I think should have happened was a choice between how you get rid of the angels. In some of the events, Kaido comes up with some real Looney Tunes plans for dealing with the enemy humans without killing them, and one method in particular stood out to me, taking or disabling the comps without fighting them directly. Naoya is a killjoy and shoots this down saying the demons couldn't do it covertly and you don't have enough control over them, but my rebuttal is, why not? In Amane's route, you have full control of the demons, but in Naoya's you don't for, like, no real reason. It's been established that some demons can disguise themselves as humans, so you could have gotten some demons to steal comps, or maybe empower an electric demon to fry all the comps that don't belong to your party and friends. An alternative choice could have been proposed by Atsuro, where you focus on getting the public to sympathize with you. Maybe you could send demons to save people, like a kid trapped in a burning building, or something that already happens in the game. Save demon tamers who don't want to fight you. This would make repeat playthroughs more enjoyable than the decision of whether everyone thinks you're good or evil and do you have a bigger or smaller party. As far as central themes go, something that makes the other 8th days stand out more was talking about mythological stories that relate to their central themes, which Naoya's 8th day can't really do as there really isn't a theme. The closest thing it has to that is the power of friendship or being an overpowered edgy anime protagonist can help you kill your enemies. Maybe the game could have hinted that, instead of Naoya wanting you to kill people, focusing on a theme of second chances. The route could have a scene where you confront Naoya on what he did to you in the past, and you could all come to terms with what happened, and maybe he could apologize or say he regrets what he did. He wouldn't have to say it directly, but he could say something along the lines of, I wanted to make up for what I did to you by giving you power. If you hate me, I understand, but know that I am not your enemy. I want revenge on God for what he did to both of us. Obviously, this could and should be woven in a subtle way, but from all of my playthroughs, I haven't seen enough evidence to believe that this idea is present. Which is a shame, because I think it could elevate this good character into an amazing one. Then again, he's handled far better in the best route of the game that I saved for last. The Root of Law Working towards a world of peace and prosperity. Now, although I think this is the best route in the game, it's not perfect and it doesn't have the most amount of potential, but it does meet its potential perfectly. Admittedly, in the original game, it didn't have a lot going for it, aside from, I guess, making life better for most of humanity, or whatever. So ideologically, it was great, but from a writing perspective, it was pretty boring. The problems start as early as Ramiel's exposition dump. As soon as I heard that apparently the player is not actually Abel, but has only a part of Abel's soul, and that this is something that a lot of people have and was God's gift to Abel for letting him get axed, I got extremely annoyed. Now, normally I hate it when a character is treated like the center of the universe, but in this case you still are treated like a special snowflake, but it hurts Naoya's motivation. When I played Naoya's route, I started to wonder if God was sympathetic because he cursed Naoya with immortality with the idea of Naoya eventually mending his ways, which only infuriated him to the point of plotting God's destruction. I was thinking to myself, you know, not only is it bullshit that God didn't recognize Cain's hard work, they just stood by and let him murder my character just to teach people a lesson. And I thought that if I was God and I wanted to teach Cain a lesson, I'd reincarnate him and Abel, make them siblings again, and give him a chance to redeem himself because, as it is, God just leaves this guy to stew in his own hatred and hope that will somehow cause him to realize the error of his ways. Then I realized God literally did that, although by that point, Naoya was already dead set on killing God. 
If you're not actually able, it makes Naoya's brotherly treatment of you make less sense because you're no more his brother than any other human with a shard of Abel's soul. Now, seeing as this lie about there being a ton of people with Abel's soul actually never comes up again, and could be removed with only things to gain, I'm not going to pick it apart any further because it's not a deeply rooted issue. Something I do want to focus on, however, is Amane, since I haven't really talked about her, and that's because she's boring. She has the unfortunate position of having to share screen time with Remiel as his avatar, and as a result, she doesn't get much time to do anything, and when she does talk, most of her lines are expository. Something I neglected to mention earlier is that she, for some dumbass reason, joins you on Naoya's eighth day. The reason she gives conflicts with her motives and actions throughout the entire game, but similarly to the a lot of people are able actually point, I'm just going to say it should have been removed and move on. Something I find a little unfortunate about her, aside from her lack of character development, is the missed opportunity with her slash Remiel's contrast with Naoya. In the seventh days, Atsuro is amazed when he enters Amane's soul and shows fear for what might happen to her in the battle against Jezebel. There's an interesting contrast in Naoya saying, souls aren't as vast as one might imagine, compared to Remiel's statement that, human souls aren't so weak. Neither of these statements are necessarily contradictory, just pessimistic and optimistic takes on the nature of the soul that can show the cynicism the characters feel. This also contrasts nicely with Naoya's nigh-unbreakable smirk and Amane's deadpan frown. The reason I say nigh-unbreakable is because there are several instances where he will not be smiling, those being when he's angry and ranting about God or when he's been bested in some way. Compare that to Amane's one-tone expression and the problems become clear. Now, it's not as if she only has literally one expression through the whole game, but her expression is always deadpan. Now, similarly to Naoya, her expression being mostly unchanging can be a really good writing tool, because the advantage of having a character whose expression is usually the same is that the moment it breaks usually ends up being pretty powerful. It's a real missed opportunity, and a scene with her smiling would be extremely memorable, as well as giving her an opportunity to have some closure for her involvement in the story. But seeing as she didn't do that much in the first place, I guess it's not as big of a deal as it would have been for other characters, but it's still pretty disappointing. But that's enough about disappointment. Now it's time to talk about the eighth day of this route. This is probably the best day in the entire game. When I said this route lived up to its potential perfectly, I was talking about this day. Let's start from the top. You won. You became the King of Bell and swore allegiance to God. The angels are helping to organize the situation and get people back to their normal lives with the encouragement to love thy neighbor and all that shit. Unlike at the end of the seventh day where the game presents this as an Orwellian nightmare because changing the status quo must be evil, the eighth day here makes this seem like a victory for the forces of justice and that going forward you're going to be helping people become more sympathetic, which actually happens. Unlike in the other eighth days where the distractions from their main plot are kinda pointless and don't add anything, especially now yes. The events you do here that aren't part of the main quest are about helping people move past their trauma and putting misguided people on the path for redemption, which supports the main theme of this route. Whereas Yuzu's eighth day had the theme of taking responsibility for your mistakes and Naoya's had... um... nothing. This eighth day focuses on the importance of family and forgiveness. The first case we see of this is in the Ark of Honda. Honda's a pretty sympathetic character who got stuck in the lockdown trying to get the funds to pay for his son's hospital bill, who died thanks to the cruel hand of the private healthcare system. In every single ending, no matter what you do, Honda will always suffer a fate of sorrow or death. In Yuzu and Naoya's eighth day, he either dies by your hand or goes insane from demonic power. In Amane's eighth day, he tries to break out because the comp he uses in the game is what he needs to get to the powers that be in order to pay for his son's medical bill. Because, I guess he doesn't think the world changing to sympathize with others and being selfless wouldn't include helping the dying? In any case, this route is the only one where he doesn't seem to go insane because the demon aid he gets doesn't come from opportunistic demons, but a deity who genuinely sympathizes with his plight. This does a lot with very little. Not only does it establish what was always kind of flimsy before with the exception of Black Frost, and that's the idea that demons can be relatable and want to help humans without taking advantage of them which I like to believe is the writers realizing they never utilized demons to their full potential. Aside from using demons well and setting up the big baddie of the day, this arc also highlights the importance of family, with the obvious link being Honda wanting to save his son, which the demon Susanoo can relate to. I'm not going to focus too much on the mythological background because I'm not that well versed in it, and the game will tell you everything you need to know about the important demons of this day. 
Another link to the theme of family and forgiveness I want to focus on is Kaido's involvement with this day. Now, similarly to Amane and Naoya's route, Kaido helping police officers hold back demon tamers here is really stupid, and if anything, he should have probably helped Honda with his escape attempt considering they were once allies, and Kaido wouldn't want to give up his power. That being said, I really like his inclusion in this route because he has brotherly troubles, and although it isn't outright stated, I think the reason he wanted to help out your party despite your radically different beliefs is because despite the fact that he only ever complained about his brother, he really did care about him and didn't want his brother's legacy tarnished. He took up the mantle of leading the demons despite not really wanting to, and he hunted down the demon that murdered his brother and wanted to kill it so badly despite the danger it would put him in, with no material reward. Kaido being in the 8th day wasn't handled great, and if I were to change it to make it better while fitting in the themes of family and forgiveness, I'd make Kaido want to break out at first, but have a change of heart. It would be good for him to maybe try and help break Honda out after hearing his plight, and maybe even humbling himself to beg your team to let Honda escape. I think that he's very much the type of person who values family and would want to help Honda out out of sympathy. This could culminate in you recruiting Kaido and telling him you want to make the world a better place, where no one will have to die because of the bullshit system they live in where people can die because they didn't get the necessary treatment. If Mari's alive, she could encourage him to join you, and if she's dead, you could ask him to think about what Mari would want him to do. As it is, Kaido's placement is kinda bizarre, but unlike with Amane and the King of Demons route, there's enough nuance in the writing to think of a good way he could have been incorporated. Now, we move on to the main conflict, and I'm not referring to the conflict of Yu versus Okunanushi. The conflict between Naoya and Abel has only been somewhat acknowledged in Naoya's own route up until now, but this route gives not only the best closure for Naoya, but beautifully ties everything together, promising a hopeful future for everyone, including him. By learning of various mythological and biblical stories from Amane, Honda, and Azuma, you eventually figure out how to get through to Naoya and convince him that he doesn't need to live in hate and loneliness anymore. And unlike his plan which involves killing God and possibly other people who stand in your way, you can do it without having to kill anyone. This all culminates in one of the best scenes in the game where you face off against a guardian god of Japan, Okunanushi. Okunanushi declares you a false messiah if you fail to get Naoya to move past his hate and gain redemption. The old god values brotherhood greatly in spite of the horrible things his own brothers have done to him, and doesn't believe you are worthy to lead the world into a new age if you cannot save Naoya. Even though you fail by the given time no matter what, when you must fight Okunanushi, Naoya comes through for you. In the best part of the game, Naoya joins the fray after you repeatedly kill the god to no avail as he can simply revive himself. Naoya blocks off Okunanushi's magic and fights against him. Mm. Mm. He is my brother, you boar! I won't let you kill him! Despite everything that's happened, despite the fact that he not only killed you, but when you sided with God he tried to kill you again, he sees your sincerity when you tell him you love him, and after everything that's happened, Naoya goes to fight at your side, to give you the right to lead the world, even if it means helping the God he despises so much. I don't know if I've been too harsh or too generous when analyzing this game. On the one hand, as I've pointed out, its flaws are many, and its pros can sometimes be lost amidst the issues, but in spite of that, it's an excellent game that if you haven't played despite watching this much of the video, then I encourage you to play it and come to your own conclusion about what's likely the best Megaten game. Thank you so much for watching. I wrote this essay a few years ago and decided on a whim to make it a video. It was certainly a challenge at times, but this was really fun, and if at least one person got enjoyment out of this, then I think it was a worthwhile endeavor. In the months to come, I'll be working on turning another essay I wrote in the past on Devil Survivor 2 into a video, so stay tuned for that and maybe try to get Devil Survivor 2 while you can, as Devil Survivor 2 is another 3DS game that won't be available digitally after March of 2023. If you made it this far, then I hope you'll return to see that video whenever it comes out, and I hope you have a phenomenal day. Thanks again for watching.